Okay, I'm Danny Trenary. Uh, this is my wife. I'm Katie. Okay, <laughs> I'll talk. Yeah, you okay, talk. so uh, we have been in business. This is our 15th year in business. Um, and it's also our 15th year of marriage, so it's kind of cool. Um, we started business, uh, basically I told him to quit his job when we were pregnant with our first child. I was like, why are you working in that job if you're not happy? And he, he was like, yeah, maybe I will quit and I'll do what I want to do. So he stopped what he was doing, which was? Uh, I worked at an HVAC company um, making ductwork, just sheet metal ductwork. Um, that was, I think, like five or six years. I, I everything gets fuzzy because our day is kind of scooped yeah. right now. But I think it was like five or six years. Um, yeah, I mean, it was one of those careers that I just, I, I did not see myself being there for 30 years. And so I didn't know what to do with that. Yeah. And I complained about it every day. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And in your spare time, you were making like art. He was like stealing company time <laughs> in making art um, no. on the side. No, he wasn't. Yes, he was. <laughs> and um, I was like, oh, it's so beautiful. You're so talented. You need to stop doing your job. And so um, eight days after our first child was born, we got our business license mm -hmm. and lost health insurance. And we've been doing the same thing since. And now we have seven kids <laughs> and we have a big, bigger business. Yeah, it's, we've been blessed a lot. Yeah. When I was a kid, I always expected that I would do something one day. I was like, I'm going to have a, a art shop. Didn't even really know what what to call any of this stuff. Yeah. Um, no zero anything about business. Don't know where to start. Don't know how to start. We still don't um, know anything. And about we uh, yeah. It, it was kind of a shock because when you're used to having a paycheck every week, and then you're like, not sure where the money's coming from. Uh, yeah, so that was that was the sticker shock I think for the business part of it. Because yeah. We were like, okay, well, we quit. Our job, we can't exactly go back because I mean we probably burned bridges in the yeah. process. Um, so we had to we had to learn really quick and figure it out. But you couldn't find welding work um, necessarily enough to pay our bills, so you were doing right. drywall and carpentry and <laughs> everything under the sun. Um, and then he yeah. actually started like working on building a house with this with this other person and in Kentucky and and all of that kind of like led us to where we are. So in, when we lived in Kentucky. He, um, he started doing trailer repair, which got him in the door with making railings with another guy. And long anyway, story. Yeah, it's a long story, but <laughs> it's an adventure. Every, every yeah. day has been an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And, um, we started just like selling on Etsy actually in 2009 and, um, we made, basically made a living off of toilet paper holders and hooks. And actually that paid all our bills. Nails, like, we made nails. Nails, yeah, the very small stuff, but it added up, you know, like thousands of dollars a month. And, but then he started being a slave to the orders, you know what I mean? So he, we, we were like praying and- We became a production shop. We, yeah, and he doesn't mass produce years. things, but he was required to make things exactly like they were in the picture. And so he really wanted to make one thing unique. He didn't want to make like the same thing over and over. So it was my job to get him the work that he wants. So, um, and it's his job to do the work that I give him. So we're, we have that dynamic, but, um, anyway, yes. so we started praying in about 2012 for bigger jobs, railings, local jobs, and God provided. And in 2016, they started flooding in and we were doing gates and railings and, mm -hmm. um, security bars and, and they're decorative. They're not just what everybody does. We don't, we, from the beginning, we didn't want to be a railing company. We don't want to be, um, a company that just, a welder. We, no, when people say, oh, so you're a welder, I'm like, mm -mm, no. And, he, and then they say, oh, he doesn't weld. I'm like, he does weld, but he, he's not a welder. You want not, to be a little more refined. Yeah, we, we're that. high end iron decor. And so in 2020, we were really blessed because even though the pandemic happened, we were able to stop selling on Etsy altogether and focus all on local work because people were stuck at home and they wanted to redo their homes. They wanted to redesign their whole house. So that was our client base and especially around DC, people who have computer jobs got really bored. Really? And so that was like the perfect clientele. But yeah, that's basically um, our condensed history. <laughs> So we post all of our work on our website and I try to, um, I have a, a form on there. People can contact us for custom jobs that they want. We get requests for, for everything from doors, people, he made it an aluminum door. Yeah. It, 
yeah, it, okay. totally out of scratch. <laughs> he bought aluminum sheets and he made a beautiful door. Um, like it, they want it was for a garden in DC, and they wanted it to look like an interior door, it like never with the regular panels that you see. Anyway, so he made it, and um, it was amazing. And the price tag reflected it, but yeah, it was <laughs> it was amazing. And so basically, there's we do have um, kind of like a a requirement for how artistic the job needs to be. If they want a standard railing or gate, we're not the client. We're not the the company for them. But if they want something artistic that they can't find anywhere else, then yeah, because he he's you're amazing. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's funny. So for me, I get so it's kind of weird. Like I can't really attach myself to jobs that I do. So here, I actually forgot about the door. Um, there's so many projects that either will be driving down a road and we're like, we know this road, why? And then like, I'm like, oh, that, that was like the most painstaking job I've ever done in my life. Yeah. And I can't even remember half of these things. Yeah. It's just weird, so. Our work is sprinkled yeah, all over, all over <laughs> DC, um, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia. I mean, we have work actually in Germany, like, and Japan. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And in California, New York, all, like people still order fireplace screens, custom fireplace screens, which is kind of like, from somebody who never had a fireplace, I'm like, why do people, people need it? Um, we have clients who <laughs> value, toilet, still to this day, value toilet paper holders so much that they will contact us and say, hey, I bought a toilet paper holder from you like five years ago. I need another one exactly like it. And I'm like, okay, it's gonna cost like five times as much. And they're like, yeah, whatever it takes. And they will literally throw <laughs> money at us. I had clients say, I don't know what to do with my, I have nothing, I don't know what to do with my towels until I get my towel bars. And I'm like, <laughs> Ah, oh, we still don't have towel bars uh, or toilet paper holders in our house. Like, <laughs> and we've never had a fireplace. We've never had a fireplace, but he made, he's made over 300 custom fireplace screens with like hand forged, you know, elements to it. It's very beautiful, and and he makes them so they they can attach to the fireplace, even though he's never been there or measured it. And they are awesome. So yeah, people can look at that on our website. But like, that's a specialty. He does yeah. custom things even when he can't see the place in person. But yeah. We, um, it makes us different. Yeah, different. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So. Do you have a uh, favorite piece that you've done? Oh, man. So I was just asked this last night because I met this kid. He's like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, man. Um, so he asked me what my favorite job was, too. And honestly, I feel like part of me wants to say the last job that I just finished was my favorite job because there's something about each job that I really love, of course, something I really hate. Um, but I'm trying to think about that one job like that I'd be known for and I don't know if I have that yet. Well, <laughs> I feel like they're in different categories. We have like the biggest job, the hardest job, yeah, and they're and they're all a favorite for different reasons. Yeah, like the biggest just, job was they're all different too. A staircase, like he's no, he's worked. He's actually just finished up his third yeah. complete staircase, not a railing, but like actual staircase with no with no engineer drawings. Like he. We have an engineer friend who comes. <laughs> Don't worry, everything's fine. It's okay, uh, they're fine. Everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> but, I mean, an engineer came and looked at it, he was like, oh yeah, that looks great, you know, and he was like, this is really too heavy duty, but yeah, like, so there's the biggest job, and, and the hardest job would be clients that you can't please. There are some, there are like two or three in our history yeah. that no matter what we've done, and like we've gone belly up on the price and everything, you cannot please them. Some people are gonna be like that. I was, I was raised in a house like that. Sorry, Dad. All right, and so then I think the coolest thing, yeah. though, I th I think the coolest thing that I've got to make was the um, that panel, that security panel. Yeah, Ivy hand forged um, Ivy. Yeah, I mean it was one of the, and we don't get many like this, but when the customer actually says, "Look, I just like what you do. Just make it. I don't know what it's going to look like." Yeah. And so they kind of like when they when they turn you loose and you get to make something. It's very rare that we get to because yes. normally we sell products by pictures of, of passwords. Yeah, they're like, oh, I want that. And so he makes that. And so people yeah. are really trusting a lot when I sling a sketch out and I'm like, well, it could look like this. And um, and they get excited. When they get excited, yeah. that makes me excited. And so we did one um, and we actually ended up, she loved it enough that she asks us to do another job. Same kind of thing, you know, yeah. just Two more shoot jobs. from the hip yeah. kind of thing. And so yeah. I think that one's kind of the coolest. We did a, uh, a five foot. Oh no no! Can I say what the most weird, the weirdest request was? It's, okay, it's, it's the one. I yeah. know what it is. Okay, yeah, yeah. so this one guy <laughs> who swallows corkscrews, 
um, <laughs> asked us to yeah. make um, like a corkscrew, twenty-six like, inch long corkscrew. It looked food like food grade stainless steel. <laughs> it looked like and the dog screws for your yard. Swallow it, yeah. So we we, we thought about that long and hard and. <laughs> we decided not to do it because we didn't want to lose our home well, or our it was, house. It was so sad because family, he yeah. gave us, like, they had to be exact spec yeah. specifications right. because if not, like, it killed a guy. Yeah, he said if I'm it's, not, a, if it's a millimeter <laughs> off, I could die, so I needed to be exact. And we, I know Danny could have done it because he does that, but we did not want that responsibility. But when you, like, you hear yeah. about it, you're like, yeah, that sounds neat. I can do it. And then yeah. you think about it. It's normally after you think about it or you sleep on it, you're like, I, I, I don't, don't Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that one. But that was what's cool. your, what were you going to say is the weirdest job? No, the most unique. I was gonna, okay. I was gonna talk about the unique job. Um, the we did a, a five foot diameter lion's head yes. for an outdoor fireplace. Beautiful piece. Yeah, um, all scrolly forged work. And it was it was a style that I don't really normally do, so it was kind of cool. So it made it different. Uh -huh. But then it was kind of a bummer because she the lady had wanted it to be backlit, so it was really like yeah. magnificent at night. And with the roughness of her stone. Yeah. We put it up there and it looked great, and then you get 10 feet away and you couldn't see it at all. And so it kind of just yeah. completely disappeared. Because it was like all different color stonework and different, yeah, different so depth. Kind of a letdown. But, but <laughs> it's still really a beautiful cool piece. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, oh, man, I lost it again. I'm hanging on to stuff and you keep saying <laughs> stuff and I lose it. Oh, oh, okay. But we, um, we have had the honor and the privilege of having like big wig actors, like football players. Um, Steelers football players, mm -hmm. Google executives, Target CEO to be our clients. And I don't know how they find us, but they do. And and I I find out because of their email address who they are. You know, I'm like, oh, who is this? I'm like, oh, wow. But yeah, it, they are like, I don't know how they're finding us, but big interior designers from New York City, you know, they're, oh. Dan, Danny is the go-to source for their, their ironwork, which I'm so proud of. Yeah. I got one. Oh, what? The coolest one. Yeah. Um, when we were first starting out, well, not first, but when we, we were starting to sell on Etsy a lot, um, one of the, the biggest things for us was uh, somebody that was high up with Ralph Lauren had oh, reached yes. out to us in New York, and they were like, hey, yeah. so we want a couple of your hooks. Um, and I think we made design, did we design it? We designed it, it? Yeah. yeah. So we designed this hook for these people. For their dressing rooms, yeah. And so, yeah, they bought a couple for a dressing room and some fancy in New York City. Department store. Yeah. And then next thing you know, like, uh, I think they ordered a bunch more. Oh, to they go ordered like else. almost a thousand of them over time. Oh, I and mean, so, and it was awesome. We're yeah. nobody. And we're, we're like, nobody. this is really cool. Like, we just did yeah. something for And we just a bid guy. a job for Jeff Bezos. <laughs> we just bid a job for one of Jeff Bezos' extra houses in DC. Which is funny. Like, it's just weird. a rolling gate. So we'll see if that yeah. happens. But, yeah, like, dude. Like, People reach out for, yeah. and we don't know. No, we don't. It's, it's neat. <laughs> it's like, part of the game. Really blessed and grateful, yeah. Okay, so the question we get asked a Ooh, lot. No, wait. About our business name. That's what I was going to say. <gasps> We're like there one person. Go. Okay. So, yeah, we get asked a lot how we came up with Vinton. Um, so, that's an easy one for me. Yeah. So, I, you know, my dad was a factory worker. And you know everybody has a side gig, and his side gig was doing collision repair in his little one-car garage in the middle of town, doing stuff you're not supposed to. You can't paint in neighborhoods, but we yeah. did. he did. And so he was always into this, you know, junk. And uh, he was part of a Mustang club, and so they would, the, the members would get together, and they were like, "Hey, you can paint." And so they'd bring this basket case car over, and, and he'd be fixing this thing. And so I got into old cars. I really liked that stuff. And so when I was a kid, I used to draw pen and ink stuff all the time. And I was like, one day I'm going to have a business and I'm going to call it Vintage, yeah. which stands for Vintage 10. So the first car was a 10 Lizzie. Of course, Vintage, that's a given. Um, and so I was like, you know, I'm going to I'm going to build hot rods for a living. That's what I'm going to do. Like, that's my life. And so, you know, as a kid, you know, hot rod magazines everywhere, pictures, you know, I try to go to whatever car shows I could go to talk to whatever car people I could find and never got into it. <laughs> Except, no, when we lived in Kentucky. I did work for a, for a high-end builder. Um, car builder, for yeah. a month. The car builder. Yeah, it was a, yeah. It was a street ride shop. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the guy had 50 project cars going at once. And I was like, man, I'm living a dream. This is really cool. Until you start seeing the people that you're working with or seeing the guy that runs the company. They were crooked. It so, really wasn't yeah. good at all, but you know, it, it gave me 
just that other bit of experience that, hey, you know, I got to work. Yeah. You know, I had His my dream, dream job came for, true a, for, for a month. month. No, but then that's not really what you wanted but, to do. Like, he, as he got going, he found out what he wants to do is just make different things all the time. So yeah, it's, it's I get really, bored quick. yeah, like we have no idea what the future holds. We don't know what jobs we're going to have, what he'll end up doing, but, but it's still building cars. The door is wide <laughs> open. Yeah. So it kind of can't get yeah. away from it. He, you know, he custom fabricates so many things for all of our, we have five old cars, but, and I told him, I said, honestly, I, don't know how many I would be happy to just keep bringing them because it gives us more privacy. If you line the front yard with cars. Yeah. yeah. Till the county yeah. comes out. I'm okay with it. They're going to watch the video and come knocking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, but for a long time, he didn't even have a real anvil for like the first four years. Four years. It was, yeah, of, four years. Of doing blacksmithing. What did you use? I had a, um, I had a piece of train track that somebody had given me. Um, and I'm somebody out there, you know, I know they know what I'm going through because they've tried it too. Yeah. Um, you know, I was under the impression that you need a, just a chunk of mass, you know, to, to yeah. beat on. And so I was like, well, anvils or uh, train tracks pretty heavy. Uh, it turns out it's, it worked. I mean, it served its purpose for four years. Yes. And I had a friend come over and he was like, hey, uh, we should find you an anvil. And so we found one and bought my first anvil, which was expensive at the time for me. Yeah, right. And I well, used it, I'm like, I'm an idiot for doing the train track thing for so many years. Like, what was I ever thinking? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's one of those like, hey, that tool should have been in my toolbox for, well, since I, the very beginning. Yeah, and one thing that people ask is, where did he learn? Who taught him? And he actually taught yeah. himself. And I mean, he used to use just a torch um, in, a, in a welding shop to bend the metal, but then we had a client in when we lived in Kentucky, just for two years, we had a client say, oh, you're married to a blacksmith. She was like, oh, well, can he make security bars for me? And I'm like, yes. Had he ever done anything like that? No. no. <laughs> but that's, I'm always saying yes, because I know that sure. you can. And so he did, and he taught himself how to blacksmith. He learned all those different ty types of coal that you shouldn't use, and it was yeah, a huge was smoky mess. Um, but, and he taught himself, and, and everything he's done to this point has been just, he remembers everything he hears and watches other experts do. So we have a machinist neighbor um, who has taught him how to do, well, you already knew how to do a little bit of milling, but all these things work together and um, he picks up experiences and knowledge from other things. But um, we have seven kids and I, we told them we're not gonna pay for college, not because we don't love them, but because, <laughs> which we do, but because that's not gonna teach them anything. I went to they college. They didn't, and I didn't use my degree. I, I used my, what I learned, you know what I mean? But I didn't use my degree. So, and I didn't get, I didn't finish that. I didn't get a good degree. So my point is he didn't even go to trade school, no. but he taught himself. So we want our kids to be self propelled learners. Um, and maybe one of them will pick up some of the skills that you have, but, um, hopefully, but we want, to inspire other people to just use their God-given talents. And you don't necessarily need formal training to do that. It does help though. Yeah. Um, like in the beginning, I was, I'm still really bad at math. And I thought that if I could become an electrical engineer, yeah. it was like, that's, that's a challenge. Nobody in my family ever went to college. It was like, I'm gonna go to college. That was the plan. Um, and I'm gonna do something that's so hard because you know I'm gonna have to work for it. Of course, I ventured down the road and got very, very not even into it. <laughs> Community college is where it stopped. Yeah. And it just realized that it wasn't it. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to be certified in everything I can be. I'm going to be a oh my gosh, yeah, master this and a master that. You know, I thought it'd be really cool to just carry certificates instead of a degree. And um, so I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll get started on that. So I tried to get an electrical engineering job. You know, something that they would like apprentice and, and yeah. I mean, there's jobs like that. Yeah. And so I went into this one company that I, I heard that they hire people all the time. And I said something about electrical job and they were like, no, you just go down here to this company. They'll hire you. This was when you just came out of high school about. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I went through all that and then I realized even, even still, um, it's not that easy to get certified and everything under the sun. Um, no. but the, the whole and welding end of it, yeah. oh, very expensive, but the whole welding end of it, what I think we're touching on 30, no, 27, 28 years yeah. of, of welding. Cause yeah. you know, I got started in my dad's garage when yeah. I was a kid. 
Yeah. And so even that, I mean, with all the years under my belt, and I've had really good people train me. I've got, you know, one of my old bosses, really good friend of mine. I mean, he showed me all the ropes. Um, even still, like, there's so much to learn. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what, I know you talk a lot about what inspires you, and I would say what inspires you is when people say you can't do something. Absolutely. That fuels you completely. Yeah. And so when he was growing up, he was told, oh, you can't be an artist. You'll never be an artist. P artists don't make any they, money. They don't get paid. <laughs> you need to get a job. Boom. Like, okay, totally, fine. totally did it. Yeah. And doing it by God's provision like sure. it's working out and like we this is all this is our job like see, and we have we though. raise seven kids <laughs> and we feed them too like we do feed them and you can't have seven kids you can well. yeah <laughs> it is oh man but it's, it's dangerous great. for business though because a lot of times people will come in and and they will bring us the most difficult not obvious job in the world say can you do this and what, what do you mean and we say sure like who? like oh, we've just had them in the past can you can you, you make like, this like a staircase well no that, that's that's that uh, we've yeah. had replication work where somebody will bring like an old broken cast iron piece from yeah like, 1800s yeah and, and say hey we need a second one can you make this and we're like sure and we don't we don't normally tell them that we've never yeah no and then, or tried. like you restored like historical <laughs> things in Hagerstown. You can do it. And, yeah, like we don't ever turn it down. But yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. figure it out. We we'll really, it. yeah, exactly. That's pretty much our motto. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah, on the fly. Yeah, shoot from the hip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We do traditional and would you call it new age? I don't even know. So we're in between where like some jobs we get are like traditional joinery. Like I have a little piece over there where it's, there's no welding, it's all riveted together. And then we'll do other things where we incorporate the two. So like the railings are mostly forged but welded, if that makes sense. Everything in here, machine or equipment-wise, everything we have is super, super old. Um, and my my thought and theory behind that is, if I'm making old things, it would be cooler if I were using old tools to do it. And so, uh, like the forge that I'm using, this thing is uh, early 1900s, which is pretty cool. Bought it at an antique store. The guy didn't uh, he didn't understand when I told him that I was going to use it on a, on a regular basis. He, he thought I was going to actually buy it to resell it. When I told him what I actually did, he finally let it go. And so we brought it home and fixed it. Um, use that guy. I love it. Uh, this is probably one of the coolest tools in here. This is our 50 pound little giant power hammer. And so for all the guys out there that watch like Forge and Fire and uh, actually that's the only show. They use uh, like older or newer versions of the same thing, but this guy, it's basically, it's, it's an elbow saver. And so instead of me having to beat this all the time, this guy does it for me. Love that thing. This was made in 1948, uh, and we actually picked it up in the town where it was sold. 
And so it was sold to a company and it, it stayed there until I actually found it. Brought it home and now she's staying. She's never leaving. We built this shop, we, we broke ground for this shop in 2018, but before that we were, we had been working out of, a, for four years, he worked out of a, uh, the Musselman apple plant in Inwood. Um, there's like an old it was the factory machine shop building. full of old stuff. I mean, it was like, <laughs> it was very bad ventilation. It was, it was dirty, just really, it was really, low ceilings, no yeah, ventilation. There was like, no I don't know, 5,000 square feet, but it was, yeah, not convenient. No electric, not really a lot. Well, of no, it had, it had, that was the only thing it had No going running for. water. And no so, water. anyway, so for four years he worked out of that, but before that he was working out of like uh, under an easy up in our driveway with the one car. No, 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 sorry. Time yeah, up. no, we're way. That's... So before the Musselman <laughs> apple plant, he had worked in a, we had gotten a uh, detached garage that we rented. And so he worked out that. I'm going to go backwards because it's more fun that way. But before that, <laughs> he had worked under an easy up in our driveway. And the welding table was, outside. The welding table was outside. But the tools were out of the rain. The tools were in the shelter. And then before that, pole he had barn. been working out of a pole barn. Um, but it was a dog kennel. It was a dog kennel. I mean, we have so, really humble it's beginnings. It's a very skinny section to work in, but it was, it was that, out of the weather. It was before good. Before that, he was working out of a driveway with no no shelter. And then through, the, enclosed trailer. through the winters, yes, out a of small a little, five uh, foot enclosed yeah, trailer. Five foot trailer. And then before that, it was just out of the bed of a pickup truck for like two years. Yeah. And so like, <laughs> we finally have the shop that we had been praying for and planning all these years. And so, like he even put like special stuff in the floor, like this long metal beam here. Channel. was Channel? Okay, <laughs> I don't do that, do that work. This long metal channel, what are you talking about? Okay, so all the channel, there's channel everywhere in the floor. And the point of that was, for one, I can weld equipment to it. So I welded my vices to it. But if I ever get tired or want to change the floor space around, I cut it off, I can move it to that section. Um, when we do really long pieces of railing or sculptures or, I mean, we've even used it for our staircases and whatnot, um, we can weld it directly to the floor. <laughs> yeah, it's super And that heavy. way, you know, we know it's stable. We know that that's absolutely level, so we can build everything off of that. Yeah, because the concrete's not level. Yeah, the concrete's like concrete. But the metal is. And so Danny's out here working by himself, and so it just makes it super safe. And I was going to say the power hammer is actually anchored by... There's more under Oh yeah, we got like a three foot deep chunk of concrete underneath of that yeah. because without it, we'd have cracks everywhere right, on this so All this floor. was planned out, yeah. We have a heated floor uh, that doesn't work yet, but it's heated, it's it's ready to go. Haven't used it. Uh, I mean, we're spoiled, we HVAC yeah. the place. Yeah, we have AC in here. <laughs> we traded eight, I mean, you know, a railing for AC. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we do that kind of stuff. And so yeah, it's just, it's one of those things where Every place we'd ever worked, we made. I made notes in my head, and I was like, "When I, when we have, when we build our own place, we want this, we want this, we want this." Yeah. Because it's just going to pay off in the end, and so if the building is not as big as it could be. Right. So I feel like if because it was any it keeps bigger, adding cars. It would. <laughs> yeah. if, it was, <laughs> if it was any bigger, it would spiral out of control. You know. You would have more cars. There would, you, literally, that's what's taking up all the space. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well. Maybe, maybe right. <laughs> but uh, winter time is amazing because with the heated floor, well, it's, the floor is insulated under the concrete. And so just having our wood stove going and our ceiling fans on, we're 70 degrees. I don't even really have the floor heated at all. It doesn't have to be. Um, it's the best working conditions I've ever been in. We have ventilation. We put fans up in the, in the eaves of our roof just to pull the heat out and the smoke. But since we've done all that, we don't really have smoke. We've never had a nice hood that actually draws the smoke out. And so I think just by building this new building, we've probably, I've probably put, what, another five, ten years of my life or something. So I think I got ten extra years because of that. We're good. <laughs> it's always a win. Now is this a sketch of a project you had for somebody back here? Okay, so during, uh, that's how they all start. So we had our open house, one of the last open houses. Um, a lot of times, I always said that I would never do craft shows because you go to a craft show and they're always making the same thing. They're making hooks, they're making 
Actually, really, they're just making hooks. They're never really making anything cool. And I always said that if I did craft shows, I want to do neat things. And so this was uh, this was our two day event. And what it was, you know, people were like, "Hey, what are you making?" Because I'm making a thing. And so I sketched that out. I was like, "We're going to try to make that over the weekend." Well, we got this far and we stopped. And if you compare the picture to actually what we made. I changed it up a little bit because something something messed up somewhere. I was like, ah, forget it. We'll just go another route. So this was supposed to look like the picture, and so it'll probably never be finished unless we have another open house. Can I? And then we'll finish it the out. The reason that it doesn't, it's not finished, is because he ended up talking. So this was him making this. This was 16 hours was, worth. Okay, when you said it took you two days to make that, I was like, oh no, don't say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so he and he like would do a little bit and then talk for well, a couple I, hours. I like to yeah. engage with. Yeah. You know, people. He just was doing this for entertainment, but that, that that's exactly how our jobs start out. That's exactly why that's and actually, still in the so, shop. Actually, so yeah, we could point that out. Um, I, I keep all the cool ones. So a lot of our jobs have to be sketched out so that we can either make scale drawings or at least see where we're going with it. So the one piece that I thought was really cool started out to be this guy. This is this is full size, so it's it was eight feet tall. Um, yep. So back it was eight feet tall. All right. All right, so the piece ended up being eight feet tall. Uh, man, it weighed 150 pounds, at least. And so this was just a rough, just to get everything laid out, because normally I'll draw it out and then I'll make individual pieces and lay it down, make sure that it all you know flows and goes well. And we ended up adding so much more to this. These, they don't look like it, but they ended up being ivy leaves and there were just vines everywhere. And so this was uh, this was a really fun piece because this is one of those things where the lady was like, just make a thing. And so I gave her a sketch that looked worse than this and she loved it. Yeah. And so made the sketch a little better. But normally when I do a sketch and I'm making a piece, you find out really quick what flows and what doesn't flow. And so you add things and we add a lots of stuff. A lots of stuff. A lots of stuff. We add lots yeah. of stuff. <laughs> So yeah, so that's how they always start out. They start out with cardboard. So every time you see a box or cardboard somewhere, it's it's a railing job or it's um, like this was laid out for a fireplace screen. It was a specific size, and we had to uh, we had to make sure that it fit their it was, fireplace. Yeah, it was actually crooked too. Oh yeah, very crooked, which you'd never tell. So a lot of times he's making custom ironwork to fit a crooked spot in a house. And then that was part of a railing that I was laying out on my table, which is very interesting. So the problem when we do, um, well, when we have people come over and they're like, hey, we want to see your work. The biggest problem we have is we make it and it goes away. We don't hang out. These are jobs that are ready to be installed and so they have to be delivered. So today was a good day because we have some work sitting around. Um, this is another client that's uh, Shepherdstown. She's a, an avid cat lover. And so she, she knew that she wanted a cat and she wanted to incorporate it into a railing. And so this was our take on it. Um, and next step is headed to the powder coater, yeah. which waiting on me. <laughs> <laughs> but normally when people come out, there's nothing sitting around, unless it's something we're in the middle of. And so that's always, it's sad because so many people were like, hey, you know, I want you to make a job for me. We want to come out and see what you have. Well, the problem is, <laughs> We can only show you pictures because we don't have it. <laughs> Unless it's rare. This is a rare occasion. This was a gift for, uh, for Katie for Christmas one year. This is just a really small sample of what he makes. So like a lot of time clients want something that's like four or five feet in diameter. But this is just, um, so one thing that makes Danny very unique that we didn't talk about is that we don't use computers to design anything. Um, a lot of times you'll see these like metal signs floating around like, you know, they're well, usually like circular. Yeah, I like that. I uh, like the cat. It's not a, um, it's not a cat drawing or a, on a plasma no. table. That's we took hand the drawing. Work and then he sketched it, he made his fit, you know, like he does it all by hand with torch, um, plasma cutter, not with a computer. We detest computers. We feel like that takes all the art, artistry out of this particular craft. Um, but it's really cool. I wanted to show you that we actually started blacksmithing by making this hook. Like this hook, we sold 
I don't know, probably a Can't thousand or more of these. Yes. And this was the beginning of our our career at Vinton. We call them the teeny tiny books. And literally at four dollars a pop, this is how we paid our bills for years. And then it turned out to be something bigger, you know, as he honed in his skill. And um, you know, now he makes big things. I'm trying to advertise that he makes sculptures because we it'd be nice, one person. it would be nice if he could start making functionless art. You know what I mean? <laughs> now it's functional, but I want him to have a client that's like, you know, there's no amount of money too big for this. I will pay whatever for the, you build me a son for my yard. Like, like anything, like you know, like child. literally, no, like a son. <laughs> so that would be. S-U-N. Like I want him to build, build like, you know, like you see like the big horses, but that's been done too much. I yeah. want him to build something very unique. Elephant. I, we're looking for a client. We are hunting our clients. We, we, we are. are client hunters, are. yeah. I think Miller Jeep in Winchester reached out to us, I think it was 2020, right? Yeah. So the Jeep Gladiator just came out. Everybody was so excited because they finally made a new Jeep pickup. And uh, these guys reached out to us because they saw something on Instagram, I think is what it was. And they were like, hey, so, you know, we have these Gladiators. We want to be the first people around to customize one. You know, we want the rock guards or the rock sliders for the running boards. We want a lift kit. We want to do all this stuff. We uh, we had put a picture of a bumper that I built for our family van. I know it sounds redneck, but they saw that, fell in love with it, and they were like, "Oh, we want to we want to do something similar on our Jeep." And we're like, "Okay." And so they brought their brand new Jeep. It had whatever miles from Winchester up here. Um, it was like thirty some miles, and they were like, "Look." Can you design a set of steps for these things so that we can be the first people because there's no aftermarket support for these things whatsoever? And so I'm thinking, wow, that, that sounds kind of cool. You know, brand new Jeep, I get to make stuff. Um, and we actually, I keep looking in the corner because they're standing up. Katie wants me to drag them out, but they're kind of heavy and they're really filthy. Like I got to dig them out, but right there in the corner. Um, and not to mention, why would I want people to get that close because they'd make them. And so I have the first prototype set of rock sliders for a, uh, a, a Jeep Gladiator pickup truck. And so I decided not to go through with it because I was, you know, it was one of those things where I had a neighbor bring up a good point about, you know, insurance liabilities in case something were to go bad and my product being out there. And so for a prototype, I figured it wasn't worth it. But the story's cool. I thought it was pretty neat. So, you know, we get weird things like that that just kind of happen throughout our our career and it's just you know those are the neat things that I want to remember when I'm an old guy and I'm flipping through a book and I'm like hey yeah I did make that one time because I shock myself all the time I look I don't look at our website much or Facebook and I'll be like scrolling through pictures and I'll see something I'm like man that looks really cool and then I see our watermark on it and I realized that that was our job <laughs> I don't even remember it and so it's just I don't know what that means. I don't know if it's, I'm just doing too much of it. It's pretty funny though. All right, so somebody's gonna w end up watching this and they're gonna tell me that I walk too much. And it's true because normally uh, the way a blacksmith shop is laid out is it's a triangular shape. You have your forge, you have an anvil and either a vice or a water clinch bucket or your extra tools you're gonna use. And so for me, I'm walking out of my way to go to this anvil because it's my favorite anvil. And I just would rather use this. So I'd rather be inconvenienced because normally I'm running my gas forge over here. And so my little triangle is this way. And so it's easy to jump over here, but because I like this one so much and I really don't feel like moving it over there, um, I figured I'll just walk the extra mile. Um, it's only those, those couple guys that have been doing this longer than I've been alive would even point it out. But I don't, yeah, I'll walk like 50 miles a day in here. It's all wasted.
Is okay, that, so a one of the from World War II? No, it's a practice bomb. Practice bomb. From, but it is definitely World War II. A guy stole it off of the well, a soldier stole it off of an army base. Threw it in the trunk of his car in 1955, and we ran into some really cool people. This guy was 93 years old. He stopped by the other shop, and we were just talking one day. And he was always trying to sell me something because he needed to make money, you know, to pay a medical bill or something. And uh, he's like, I got this old blacksmith made light. Do you want to come look at it? I was like, yeah, I'll check it out. I didn't want a light. So I get over there, and in this little garage, he had that thing standing up on end. And I'm like, what's with the bomb? He's like, told me the story that he threw in the trunk of his car, and he threw his jacket over it. Off the base he went. I'm like, that's cool, man. I got to have that bomb. And he was like, well, hold on. It's a table. And so he goes, and he's digging and digging and digging, and he pulls out a tabletop with a little thing that goes right in the end of the bomb. So the bomb would set up, and he just made a little tabletop for it. I'm like, dude, I got to have that bomb. <laughs> The coolest thing ever. But we get a lot of people that come in here for the first time and they just, they spend a lot of time looking around because of all the stuff. when they would decommission these. So this is uh, A303 uh, Springfield. I think that's what it was. And so they would take them. This one doesn't have it in there. But the receiver that would be screwed onto it, they would weld it. And then they would cut a notch out of the barrel. And they would either put a, a stainless steel pin or something through it, and they would weld it. And then they would just toss them. And I don't know why they never scrapped them, but people ended up with these things. And so a lot of a lot of the old people restoring guns were able to buy boxes of these things, cut the barrel off of it, reuse the receiver, and actually build like a really cool old school gun. I mean, it's great. And so these, they're awesome. They have, uh, every barrel has, and you can't see it in the camera or anything, but it has 1943 stamp, and it's got the maker's mark on it. And so there's a bomb. Let's see, right up there at the very front. Oh, wow. And so, I mean, these legit were in the hands of our soldiers during World War II. 43. Oh, 43. And so it's like, what do you do with these other than... <laughs> nothing. I have nothing to do with these, but like... Because they're so cool, like I don't know what to do. Oh yeah, the gate, that's pretty cool. That's a neat story. So a lot of things I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna tell you, there a lot of things in the shop that have a story. Which is really neat. So the gate, I have a friend um, in Inwood where they, they did I guess they're lot they widened the road when they put the first roundabout, there was an old house that sat there. And uh I guess the state comes in and they bought the guy's house and so he had to clear it out and he's lived there like 70, 80 years. I mean, the guy's been there for a long time. They dug that thing out. It was a garden gate that they took down. They had it in a cemetery. One of the cemeteries in town somewhere. I don't even know where that would be. I guess down, um, down right 11 somewhere near one of the churches. So this thing, it used to be made locally. It's a company called Stewart. And so they used to make, uh, they used to make these wrought iron gates back in, you know, 
I think they started in 1800s, they're making them 1900s. So it's, it's a good 100 years old. They don't even use raw iron. They don't even use raw iron, but it's really cool. You can't see it because my ugly mailbox is covered, but there's a nice little cast iron plaque that says Stewart, uh, made in Hagerstown, Maryland, I think. And so it was just kind of, kind of a neat piece. And so naturally, they were like, hey, would you like this? Well, sure. You've got a home. <laughs> There's always a home here. Something I didn't know until Danny started talking is that literally people don't use raw iron anymore. You can't find it. It's not in stock. You know, like it's just not there. So unless you're taking something reclaimed, you're not using raw iron. So we still advertise as raw iron because people think if it's not raw iron, well, if it's raw iron, then it's not handmade. So we think people use it interchangeably. But you want to talk about this because. It's such a value. Your pulse. Oh. Like you made it. Okay. Yeah, I made that. So. <laughs> I said that all. Yeah, I made that. Um, okay, so. Talked about the power hammer. Um, you've seen the anvil. So, another way that we move metal is with a forging press. And so I started researching these things, and they were really expensive, and I'm, I'm cheap, very cheap. So I wasn't gonna spend, it was like 6,000 bucks on one of these. And I had seen a, a guy on some forum somewhere had built one of these. And he put all his specs out there and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna give it a shot. Cause I'm a welder, I can make all this stuff. And so we ended up building our forging press. Um, works amazing. I don't know how many tons this thing is, but you know, we put in whatever, we'll squish it, we'll push it in a die uh, to do texturing. I've got all kinds of little tools that we make that everything around here that looks like scrap, they're actually tools. But, um, you know, I'll be able to push these into, into base plates to make little divots or, you know, different shapes or, I mean, anything and everything. Everything else is either super old or people stuff. Like, it's really cool. Oh, like the, uh, our big table. The table was cast iron, weighs 2,200 pounds, just without the base. That's just the tabletop alone. Yeah, the platinum table we picked up in Lancaster. Um, from an old guy, really amazing artist. Uh, never even heard of this guy, but he did. Um, well, he's done some incredible work. And he, what was it, the Chicago Arches. Zoo, I think? Philadelphia. Philadelphia Zoo. Yeah, he made this big, like 75 foot archway thing. It had animals, like three dimensional animals that he'd made. And this guy had like six or seven of these tables together, and that was his workspace. And I mean, the material he's using, I mean, this is about two inch solid, and he was using solid. I mean, he said they needed two cranes to set this piece in place. And so meeting people like that, and you know, he gave me a bunch of literature of, of the stuff that he's done, and you know, who he is kind of thing. Magic was made on that table. And so we, uh, we hit it off, kind of stayed in touch for a little bit. And so it was kind of cool to be able to say, look, you know, I'm going to take this home to my shop. One day, I'll be able to like talk to a kid. You're well, not a kid <laughs> compared to his age. I was a kid. Yeah. You know, it's just kind of cool. So what I like about this is whoever had this anvil before me fed their family on that. Mm -hmm. And here I'm doing the same thing. Um, that anvil that's right beside you, that actually came over on a sailing ship. It's that old. Like Mayflower days. So you're like. Mm -hmm. Mayflower days, but probably a little later. No, I would say, you know, more like when they kicked all the Irish people out because they were being bad and they should come over here. You know, like when we did our lineage. Yeah, sure, yeah. Danny is a descendant of, uh, of a petty thief who had to come over yes. here. His um, punishment was his come punishment to America. Was to come to America, yeah. Well, that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, that probably came over with him. Bad man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So it's just it's silly things like that that we learn along the way. It, you you ask what inspiration was. It's it's stories like that, but it's just the history, especially being in a rich area that's full of it. Um, all this old stuff that's the inspiring thing for me because I, I wish that I was born a hundred years ago. It would have been fine. <laughs> I think I could have done well before news traveled quickly. Yes. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> When Where'd the your uncle go? were brand, brand new, that would have been a nice time. You to didn't hear there. your uncle got shipped to America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's neat stuff to me. <laughs> oh, another one of his uh, ancestors was John and Porter. Like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty neat. Like, he, Danny is bad. Okay, and it is in his blood. <laughs> He's a bad guy. He's a bad dude. <laughs>
Love it. Okay, so if you want to know more about us, go to VintonWelding.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We're linked there. Um, we are always on social media all, all around. Um, we do custom jobs, so email us. Our contact information is there. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks for checking us out.